right, good morning. Welcome back to CS125. So, I guess Obama was here? Where was he? Was he like here? Was anyone here? Who saw it? Right here? Okay, I think I'm gonna stand here from, for the rest of the semester, you know? Try to get some of that positive energy. Um, all right, so we're moving on today. This is week two, and we're gonna talk about functions today. We're gonna continue to move forward through our sort of review of Java imperative programming. I shouldn't say review, our presentation of Java imperative programming. I hope you guys had a chance to watch the video lecture on Friday. If you didn't, and those are concepts that are new to you, I would encourage you to do that. You're gonna be a little bit confused today, although this topic is at least slightly orthogonal to the material that was covered on Friday, but I would encourage you to watch that. That's why I recorded it. All right, so let me pause and just point out that this is how this class works. So, you know, there are other classes on campus where it's like they baby you for the first couple weeks, you know, they have, they have a thing called syllabus week, I guess, where they talk about the syllabus for a week, which sounds to me like mind-bogglingly boring. Um, and then, you know, the first week, maybe there's no homework, whatever. Uh, not in this class. So the last couple weeks are relatively representative of how this course works. So it's not gonna get any better, it's not gonna get any easier, but it's also not gonna get, like, a lot harder. You know, I, I think for the people that are still not sure whether or not they're gonna stick it out for the semester, my goal in the first couple weeks is to present you a representative view of what this class is like. I don't wanna trick you. I don't want you to think, oh, this is easy. And then, you know, a month later, the volume starts to go up. So, you know, there'll be weeks that'll be harder than others and weeks that'll be easier than others. And there'll be some things you're gonna really struggle with and some things that are really gonna come naturally, but like, this is the rate at which we're going. And we're gonna keep that up um, <laughs> until December. So this is sort of your life in CS125. This is a typical week. This is sort of how, how you should start to think about the rhythm of this class. So on Monday, finishing off the MP. Our MP due dates are Monday, so that's gonna be the day that you're probably gonna be focused most on wrapping up the MP. We'll have a homework problem out, um, and we have lecture. We have office hours all day today. If you are not done with MP0, please come to office hours. That's what they're for. We have a large number of CAs signed up today, so there should be plenty of people to help you. I'll be down there for a couple hours. On Tuesday and Wednesday, we have our quiz out, and we also have labs. Those are also the days that you should start looking at the next MP, which will be out tonight. MP1 will be released this evening and due in a week. So that's kind of the rhythm that we're getting into. So, you know, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, we don't have office hours in 0403. We are starting residential office hours. So that's something that we're trying new this semester. I think we're gonna start that tomorrow. I'll put those up on the calendar. We're gonna have some hours in PAR. I guess that's a place on campus. Does anyone live in PAR? All right, well, you're gonna have course staff coming to you. So you can come to office hours in your pajamas or whatever. Um, and then I think we also have some somewhere else, which I'm forgetting right now. Um, it doesn't have as cool a nickname as PAR. So those will be up on the calendar. Um, but you know, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, you're working on, um, you're taking the quiz, you're in lab, you're getting started on the next MP. We have homework problems out that day. Thursday, we start up office hours really sort of for the next MP. So that's a great day to come in, get a good start on the MP that you're currently working on. If you haven't taken the quiz yet, do that. We also have homework out. On Friday, we're gonna have office hours till five. Again, you know, good chance to get uh, started on the next MP. We have lecture and we have a homework problem. On the weekend, we'll have office hours. I think those worked out okay this week. How many people went to office hours over the weekend? Okay, awesome, yeah, so I'm gonna talk to the CAs, see how that went. Maybe we'll try to get some more people, more CAs into office hours on the weekend if they were busy and popular, um, but that's, you know, a time to finish up the MP. So this is how, you know, we're gonna do things for the rest of the semester. I wanna point out something, which is starting today, the homework problems are due the day that they are assigned. There is a homework problem out today, it is due today. If you don't finish it, tough. We're gonna move on tomorrow. You have 10 dropped homeworks over the course of the semester. I am not going to extend homework deadlines, period. Okay, so if you miss one, fine. You got 10 to drop, that's okay. If you miss two weeks, we have a problem. So please start to get the habit of doing them on the day they're assigned. They're not supposed to take you very long. They're just supposed to keep your brain thinking about computer science, keeping you moving, making sure that you're synced up with what you're doing in lecture. If you're really struggling with one of the homework problems, I would, you know, suggest posting on the forum, come to office hours, because that might be a sign that there's some material 
that you're starting to sort of miss, right? That we, you know, the Palmer problems are designed to be doable given the things that we've talked about up to that point. Okay. So at this point, we really sort of finished talking about the things that computers are good at. We've talked about how to store data. We've talked about how to repeat things. We've talked about how to make decisions. We'll talk more about communication later in the semester when we do some lectures on the internet and things like that. We'll talk maybe about, a little about user interface design. Um, but we're really through the basic building blocks of, you know, the, the basic primitives, the things that computers can do well. Particularly, and these are, you know, again, remember the things that you don't do particularly well. So it's September 10th or whatever. So what are we gonna do for the next three months? Uh, well, mainly what we're gonna is occupy us for the rest of the semester is we're gonna talk about algorithms. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking about and implementing computer algorithms. This is the conceptual heart of computer science as a field, are computer algorithms. This is how we taught computers to play chess, was we developed an algorithm allowing them to do it. This is how we taught computers to drive cars and to play other games and to make recommendations online and to, you know, do all the things that they do. This is how computers solve problems. And we'll spend a lot of time both talking about, analyzing, coming up with, and implementing computer algorithms. This is a great chance for us to both continue to practice our programming skills and talk about this sort of conceptual core of computer science as an intellectual discipline, not just as an applied field. We'll also talk about data structures. So data structures and algorithms really go hand in hand. Frequently, data structures allow us to implement algorithms. The reason we choose to put data into an array or put data into a tree or put data into a hash map or a linked list is, you know, sometimes partly because that allows us to represent something about the world, but also frequently because it allows us to implement a particular algorithm. It allows a particular algorithm to work. You know, when we start talking about trees, the whole point of organizing data into a tree is that there are some really nice algorithms that you can then use on that data to find things, to compute things, whatever. And those algorithms have nice properties. They run quickly, they don't use too much space, whatever. Towards the end of the semester, we'll talk a little bit about software development. This is something that's sort of coming up in lab, it's coming up as you work on the MPs, this process of, you know, writing good software. Because as you guys start your journey in programming, you're also starting your journey, you know, being a software developer. So this is something that, you know, we're, we're gonna try to do our best to train you to do. This is one of the reasons why I've been, you know, encouraging people to look on the forum first before they ask questions. Because when you start to interact with other software developers online, this is something that will really annoy people. If you, you know, go to the Linux mailing list and be like, how do I install Linux? Um, that's probably not going to merit you a lot of really friendly responses, right? I mean, there's a lot of information online, there's a lot of information on our forum already, looking through that is, is part of the job. All right, and so, and the goal here again is to just really enjoy ourselves, right? We're gonna dig in, we're gonna talk about some really beautiful algorithms, we're gonna talk about some really fundamental data structures. This is really enjoyable stuff for me to talk about, and it's really foundational material. You know, if you understand this well, you will not have a problem going on to take courses like 126, 173, 225, and other things in the department. This is sort of the basic building blocks of all of that other stuff. If you can implement and work with trees in Java, then you're on your way to being able to implement and work with trees in C++ and do well in 225. Okay. So today we're gonna bring up a concept that starts to talk about computer structure of programs. This is not something that we really get a chance to dive into in a deep way in this class because the programs that you're going to write are gonna be fairly small. But a couple of the concepts we're gonna talk about for the next couple weeks are really sort of organizational um, strategies that allow us to uh, start to develop bigger, larger pieces of software. Things that can, you know, a whole app that you could use on your phone or a whole, you know, uh, interactive application that you might use online or a standalone application or something like this. These are big pieces of software. Imagine working on a, a tool like IntelliJ. IntelliJ you know, is this really powerful, sophisticated thing. It probably consists of millions of lines of Java code. And when we start to build big pieces of software like this, which many of you will be involved in during your career, we need some strategies for organizing things, right? So for making sure that, you know, the, 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 this big piece of code has some, you know, um, conceptual integrity to it, that it makes sense, that it's easy to extend and improve and understand. So one of the ways that we, one of the ways that we do this is we try to break our, our code, break our programs 
into small pieces that can be easily understood, that can be easily tested, and that can be easily reused. One of, you know, so, th so these are a couple different strategies we're gonna talk about over the next couple weeks. Combining state and behavior. When we start to talk about objects in Java, this is the reason why Java has this object model. It's, is, is because it provides a natural way of modeling certain concepts and abstractions that come up when we start to write larger computer programs. Documentation. So this is something we've already started to stress on MP0. As we move on, you know, we're gonna ask you to do more with check style. We're gonna create more problems for you to solve. We're gonna ask you to write documentation for the functions that you work on. We're gonna ask you to describe their parameters and what they do. This is not like a little thing around the edges. There's a reason why we have points on the MP that are, that are for, you know, this component. It's critical. If you don't write documentation for your coding, you're working with other people, nobody will be able to use it. And you won't be able, you won't be working at that company for very long. And then finally, and we'll talk about this later in the semester, finding ways to reuse things that other people have done. So when we start you out as a computer programmer, as a computer scientist, we spend a lot of time, you know, writing little pieces of code, solving little problems. You know, you'll do this for several years. You know, no, if, if you go to a company and the first thing they ask you to do is implement a linked list for them, like, quit right away. Because no one should do that. That's already been done. There is so much existing software, there are so many libraries out there for you to use that solve all these problems. Now we ask you to solve them again when you're starting out because they're a great learning experience. But in the real world, a lot of the time you spend as a software developer, as a programmer, is finding other things that other people have already built and figuring out how to integrate them into what you're trying to do. The fewer lines of code you have to write, the faster you can go, and you're harnessing, you know, a community of other people in this really beautiful sort of silent community. We'll talk more about this later. You know, when you write a good piece of open source software, you have all these collaborators all over the world that you don't even know because they're working on their libraries that you're using, and as they get better, your code gets better as well. You'll never meet these people, you'll never exchange an email with them, but your, you know, the, the things that you are able to do are at least partly in, in response to their efforts. So that's a really cool thing about computer science. And sharing your code. So again, this is something we'll talk about later. Contributing back to that community when you build things that are useful. Okay, so today's topic, the first tiny little step in this direction is something called a function. And from now on in this class, most of what we're gonna ask you to do, whether it's on the homework problems or on the IPs, is write functions. What is a function? So a function is a, is a reusable building block that does one particular thing. It's a, it's a series of, it's a, you know, a block of code. A function opens and closes a block. And it does one thing, right? So here's the definition. It's a sequence of instructions that perform a specific task. And it's broken apart from the rest of the code and packaged as a unit so that it can be used throughout your program. Okay? So let's, so in Java, a function takes a series of inputs so this is not entirely distinct from the idea of a mathematical function. So it takes a series of inputs. In Java, a function can take no inputs, and it can take many inputs. And it produces either no output or a single output. There are other programming languages where functions can return multiple outputs. Java is not one of them. So in Java, you can either return nothing, or you can return a single thing. A single, you know, uh, primitive type or a single object, which we'll talk about later. So functions, the code inside a function is stuff that will be familiar to you. Functions are built out of these basic imperative building blocks that we've talked about. Loops, conditional statements, variable assignments, things like this. In fact, for MP0, some of you didn't realize you were doing this, but essentially what you were doing is you were filling in the body of a couple of functions that we had given you. So we had given you a function and you were writing code inside of it. And when we test your code, what we're doing is we're actually calling that function and making sure that it performs properly, making sure the output is what we expect. So a good function, and this is something that, you know, you will take years to, you know, fully um, internalize and understand, right? And it takes a lot of practice to get, to get good at this, to figure out, you know, when should I break something into multiple functions as opposed to leave it alone? A 
good function does one thing. It does one thing well. It performs one piece of a computation. It can be tested easily, so this is increasingly important. One of the ways that computers help us write computer software today is we create test suites. We're using those to grade your MP, but, you know, as you move on and as you work in the real world of software development, you'll be working with test suites. You know, one of the things that you'll have to do, you know, once you have a job at Google or Facebook or whatever, is they'll ask you, they'll say, okay, I, we want to implement this new feature, write the code for it, but when you write the code for it, you're not done. Because first of all, your code has to pass all of their other tests to make sure that you didn't break anything that was supposed to work, and before that feature can go live, before you can check in your code, before you can commit that and show it to the world, you have to write your own test suites for your own code. So it's increasingly common that no code makes it into a large code base without a test or a series of tests. So you can't just write code and like, oh, I think it works. No, 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 they want you to prove it. Give me some test suites. It also helps later because if somebody changes something else, those test suites help identify that your particular feature, your particular part of this system is still working, right? And then finally, a good function, and this is, this is probably one of the most important things, can be reused in multiple places. So you don't just wanna take a, you know, a piece of code, a single function, and break it into six other functions that only get called by that piece of code. The idea with a function is that it, it's reusable. It's a, it's a part of the system that's common enough that by isolating it, by packaging it by itself, by setting it apart, it's gonna make it possible for a bunch of other things to use it. So a function that really get, only gets called once or used once in an entire piece of code is not that useful, usually. All right, so let's look at a function declaration in Java. So we're starting to zoom out a little bit. To this point, we've been focused on helping you understand the code inside a function. Today I'm gonna show you a function declaration and then you know, as we go along in the class, we're gonna zoom out even more and more to the point where you can understand an entire file of Java source code. So here is a function declaration. Um, so you'll see that there's a Java doc comment here. Uh, for the purposes of CS125, that's a required part of a function declaration. You have to have a Java doc comment. Uh, we enforce that using check style. So that has a single sentence here that's supposed to be a succinct description of this function. That first line of javadoc is one sentence. Then below it, if you want, if you have more to say, you can write more, and you can see examples of this in the code that we've given you for the MP. Down here, there's a couple of special uh, parts of javadoc. These describe the parameters to this function. And we'll talk about these in a minute. So there are two parameters to this function. There's a, there's a parameter called first number, that's an int. That's the first number to add, and then there's a parameter called second number. And those parameter tags in javadoc allow you to describe what those arguments to the function do. So the tag is called param. I typically call those arguments. I might use parameter and argument interchangeably when we're talking about javadoc. So those describe, and then there's something called a return tag. So for a function that returns something in my javadoc, I need to describe what the return is. So it says returns the sum of the two numbers. This way, when someone is looking at documentation for this, they can figure out exactly what it does. What do I pass as the first argument or the first parameter? What do I pass as the second argument or the second parameter? And what happens? What do I get back? All right, so in line eight is where the Java code actually starts. So let's look at this carefully. So the first thing I see here is a type, right? That's one of the primitive types in Java, that's int. That describes the return value of this function. What this says is when I call this function, and we'll talk about this terminology in a minute, what I get back, the result of the computation, is of type int. The next thing, add, the name, it's the name of the function. Then I have a list inside parentheses. So I have an open parenthesis and a closed parenthesis, and inside that list, I have a series of arguments or parameters separated by commas. So this allows me to, you know, use one, two, or n different arguments of this function, or zero. If there's zero, I just have an open and a closed parenthesis with nothing inside of it. So this says the first argument to add, and this looks, now this looks like a variable declaration, right? Right here, this, I hate this laser pointer. Um, 
int first number. So that looks like a variable declaration. I've got a type and a name. So it says the first argument to add is of type int named first number. The second argument to add is of type int named second number. And again, I can string as many of those as I want. The types can be different. I could have an int first and then a float, or an int and a boolean, or an int a string, or whatever. Um, then I have an open brace. And between that open brace and the matching closed brace down on line 10 is the code of the function itself. So in this case, I have a single statement, and this uses a, a new expression in Java that we'll talk about in a minute called return. And all this function does is it returns first number plus second number. This is a very simple function. I just want to point out, I, I typically try not to show you bad code in class, but this is an example of bad code. Don't write a function to add two numbers. It's too simple. I know it's reusable, but you don't need that, right? Just, you know, just do this, right? If you need to add two numbers together in your code, just put a plus between them. You don't need a function. So that's another reason not to use functions, is they're so simple that what they're replacing is, isn't worth the effort, right? We, we usually want to write functions that are a little more complicated. Okay. Yeah, question. Ah, right, okay, so the question is, what's the add? The add is the name of the function. So a function has a return type, a name, a list of parameters, and a return type, and, and a list of arguments and a return type, and a block of code. Yeah, good question. All right, I just said all this. So, how, so, okay, so here's how we declare a function. How do we use one? So this is called calling a function. This is important terminology to, to start to use and understand. In order to call a function, we have to give it the inputs that it wants. So we have to, you know, if I want to call add, I have to give it two ints. If I don't do that, I can't call it. It doesn't have enough information to run. And then I need to do something with the return type that it, that I, what, whatever it returns. I can assign that to a variable. I can include it as part of a computation. I can print it. I can discard it entirely. This is usually kind of dumb, but, um, so I have some options, uh, with what to do with that. The code that calls the function is called the caller. We sometimes refer to the function at that point as the callee, but caller is more common, right? So we say that a block of code that calls that function is the caller. Calling the function is the act of, you know, asking it to perform whatever computation it's supposed to do. As soon as I call the function, what happens? is that Java starts running the code inside that function. And the caller does not continue until that code completes. Okay, so this is important to understand. So sometimes we talk about that Java transfers execution to the function that is called. That function then runs, does whatever it does, it might loop, it might do some conditional statements, whatever, but the caller is stopped until that function returns. When the function returns, the caller receives the value and then moves on. So this is true in, in Java. There are other languages where the semantics running this are a little bit different, but we're not, we're not gonna get into that. Okay. So actually, let's just look at this in our little snippet viewer. So here's my, uh, add function. Now, so, so this modifier right here called static is required for us to be able to play with it in this little playground. For the purposes of this example, just ignore it. It will make more sense later. So what I have on line two is I have that same function called add. It returns a type int, and it takes two parameters, first number and second number, both of type int. So here's an example on line five of calling the function add. So in order to call a function, I provide the name, and then in parentheses, I provide it the arguments that it expects. So add takes two ints. And so on line five, I'm calling add. That's the right-hand part of the expression. And I'm providing it with two ints. In this case, those ints are literals, but they could be anything. They could be, va they could be variables that had ints inside of them. They could be a mixture of literals and variables. They could be the result of calling another function that returns an int. As long as whatever is, you know, inside those parentheses evaluates to an integer, I'm good. All right, so on line five, I call add, and then what am I doing with the result? So add returns an integer, and what I'm doing here, 
Remember, when we do assignment, we evaluate the right side first. So the first thing Java will do is it'll evaluate the result of calling add with three and four. What is that? What happens when I call add with three and four? I get back an int. That's the return type. What's the value of that integer? Seven. What happens to it on line five? So remember, this is a little weird when we do assignment. We do the right side first, so I evaluate the right side. I get, I get a value of seven, and then what do I do with it? I assign it to result. So once I get to line six, result contains seven. But on line six, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna use result. What am I gonna do here? I'm calling system.out.println. So that, it turns out, is a function. So hopefully this makes more sense to you. Every time we've called system.out.println, we've been calling a function. That function is called println, and the argument it takes is a string or something that it can convert to a string. So every time we call system.out.println, we've been calling a function. So you guys have been calling functions already, you just didn't necessarily know what you were doing. All right, so what am I gonna print here? How is this statement gonna be evaluated? So I'm gonna, you know, I, I call system.out.println, and then in order to, to uh, provide an argument to it, I'm actually calling add again. I call add with four and five. What's the result of calling add with four and five? I get the value nine, and then I'm gonna print nine. So like I said, I can use the result of functions in computations, as long as their return type is, is appropriate for the computation that I'm performing. So on line seven, I'm declaring a new integer variable called bigger result, and I'm initializing it to the result of calling add with 10 and 20, which is gonna return an integer, plus calling add with 20 and 30, which is gonna return an integer, plus an integer literal 10. Okay, and then I'm gonna print that. And then finally on line nine, I told you, you don't have to do anything with the return value, so I can just call add with six and seven, and the code that add will run, it will compute a result, and then what am I doing with the result? Nothing. It's like a tr uh, an ad fell in the forest, and nobody noticed, right? Um, and, in, and in general, you wouldn't do this, because why, right? Like, there's no point in calling that function if you're not gonna to, to actually do anything with it. All right, so let's see what happens when I do this. So the first system that I've printed, printed the result of calling add with four and five, which is nine, which I said what I expected. On line seven, I initialized a variable called bigger result, and that got 10, 10, 20, 20, 30, which is 90, and then I printed it. All right, questions about this before we go on? Okay, awesome. So, this is a good chance for us to review naming. So just like variables, good function names will make your life a lot easier as a programmer. Because when you call the function, frequently, so frequently, particularly when you're using other people's code, when you call a function, you don't know anything about the code inside the function. Sometimes you don't even have access to that code. That's one of the reasons we write Java documentation, because sometimes the library you're using is, you know, like some proprietary library or nobody published the source code for it. So you're calling a function that was provided by some library, and you just, you're like, I hope it does the right thing. You guys will have this experience in one of our labs when you work with some audio, because we're gonna have you use a library, and, you know, we have the source code to the library. Do you wanna read it to figure out what the function does? No way. You just wanna look at the documentation, figure out how to call it, and then figure out what to do with whatever the result that came back was. And so, if you give your functions really dumb names, like foo, bar, you know, mp1, part one, mp1, part two, or whatever, um, no one is gonna know how to use those when they call them. They're gonna be like, wait, what does mp1 part one do again? What does mp so, so good descriptive function names are a lot like variable names. They're descriptive, they're indicative of the function's purpose, which is sort of goes along with number one. Um, you know, you don't want them to be super long, but see number two. So you'll see in our testing suites, for example, we have function names like test LCM with good input. That describes exactly what that function does. It tests your LCM code with some inputs that are designed to produce 
a, you know, a correct result. They're not negative or whatever, or they're not zero. We have a function called test LCM with bad inputs. So again, what does that do? It uses inputs that should return LCM invalid. So those are ex examples, I think, of good function names. You don't really have to look at the source code to figure out what it's doing. So when a function, let's, let's talk about what happens when a function begins to execute. So you've written a function, there's a block of code that's called your function, what happens when that function starts to run? So as soon as the function starts running, it has access to the variables that it declared as arguments and to the values that the caller passed. So when you call a function, you have to provide values for all of its arguments, and when it starts to run, it has access to those values. That makes sense. It needs them to perform whatever computation. So you can sort of think of those variables as if they've been pre-declared and pre-initialized to whatever values the caller chose, okay? So this can be a little confusing to people that are new to this, because they're like, okay, I, have to, it, I thought I had to declare variables, you know? But when a function starts to run, its arguments are, have been declared, so you can access them, and they contain whatever values the caller passed. All right, so, so here's an example of this. Let's, let's do it here. So when I call add, as soon as add starts to run on line three, there is a variable declared already called first number. It's of type int. There's a variable declared called second number. It's also of type int. The values of those variables depend on whatever the caller provided. So in this case, so for example, here I can see that, and, and let me also put a print line in here at the end, so we can see what's happening here. Okay, so let's walk through what's happening when this code runs. So on line seven, so lines two through six declare a function. They don't call it. When I get to line seven, I print start. Then I call the function add on line eight. I'm gonna save the result to result. I'm not gonna do anything with it. Um, once I call add, remember the caller stops running. So I start running on line seven, then I get to line eight, then I jump into the function add. So the next line I execute is line three. So essentially I start on line seven, I print start, then when add is called, I jump into add and start executing the code here. And I won't continue down at the bottom until this function returns. So the first thing it does is print the first number, the second thing it does is print the second number, then it returns. Once it returns, I jump back here, I store the result in this new variable that I just declared and have now initialized, and then I move on to line eight, or sorry, line nine, and print n. If I call this with different values, those variables are pre-initialized with different values. Okay, good. So when we start talking about functions, this is something that we sort of like, I, I've warmed your cache a little bit here, um, because we showed you this in MP0, we hadn't talked about it yet, that's okay. It's not the first time that's gonna happen, last time that's gonna happen in this class. Return. So how does a function communicate the result back to the caller? The statement we use to do that in Java is called return. This is a very common programming construct. I can't think of a language that doesn't have it. There might be some weird, I'm sure there are languages. If you look online, there are actually these, um, I can't remember what they're called, but these programming languages that people have created just as a joke. So there's, there's actually a leak code language where you can code in like lead speak. Um, there's, a, there's these other ones that are, that are apparently sp supposed to be like purposely irritating so I, I read about one where, well, anyway, I won't, I won't uh, bore you guys with the details. You guys can look this up, right? It boggles my mind that people out there have time to do this sort of thing. It's like, I'm gonna create a programming language that's just designed to annoy people because I think it's kind of funny, right? Anyway, maybe, maybe that's what you guys do in your spare time. If so, more power to you. Um, all right, so return immediately returns a result. Immediately. I wanna stress that return is always the last thing that a function does, always. There, there's no exception to this. As soon as you hit a return statement in your function, it immediately exits. Boom, nothing else happens. 
I guess there's like one exception to that that we'll talk about when we talk about exceptions. But essentially you can think of return as the last thing that happens. If it's, if it's inside a loop, no other iterations of that loop are executed. If, if, if it's inside an if else statement, no other code below that is executed. It's done. As soon as you hit return, the function stops, takes whatever the parameter passed to return is, whatever the, you know, result is, returns it to the caller and stops, okay? Return statements can appear anywhere inside your code. They can appear inside loops. They can appear inside conditional statements. They can be the first thing that the function does. Frequently, they're the last thing that the function does. But they can appear anywhere. But regardless of where they appear, as soon as I hit a return statement, I exit. A function can include multiple return statements. This is really common because, you know, frequently I perform a computation in one way and return a value, or I do something else and return a different value. So. If a function includes multiple return statements, the value is the first one that I reach. The first one. This will probably confuse you when you work on some later MPs. You'll be like, huh, you know, I'm, my, my code isn't doing what I expect, why not? And what you'll find out is that your, your code is going down a path in one of your functions and it's hitting a return statement, and that return statement isn't returning the value that you thought. You thought it was getting down here, but it's not, because it hit a return statement earlier and stopped. So again, I want to emphasize this. Regardless of how many return statements you have, the function will return as soon as it reaches one. Any one. Doesn't matter. Okay. So the last thing is a function must return a value of the type that it declared. So this is one of the ways that we broke the code that you guys started with for MP0. It's just that we had a return statement, but it was returning an incorrect type. So if the function declares it's going to return an int, it has to return an int. If the function declares it's going to return a float, it has to return a float. When we talk about objects, if a function declares it's going to return a certain type of object, it has to return that type of object. Okay. So, I already, I already talked enough about Javadoc today. I'm going to skip this. Okay. But l let me, okay, so let me point this out. This is kind of cool, right? So why do we ask you to do this? It's because there's a tool so Javadoc on its own looks kind of like, eh, you know? But the point is, I'm, by writing structured documentation, you can take this type of thing and convert it into actual documentation. So down here, for example, let's look at this guy. All of this right here was generated by Javadoc. So some programmer at Sun, let's find one that has, here we go, value up. So, so some programmer at Sun, wrote javadoc for a function called value of that's part of the string class, which we'll start talking about on Wednesday or Friday. Um, and the parameter statement got converted to this, the return statement got converted to that, and their description of it got converted to this nice piece of online documentation. This is why you do this. Someday some of you may work at a company that publishes javadoc for your, your code. All right. All right, so let's have, oh. One other thing I wanted to talk about. So, I said before that a function doesn't have to return a value. So this is something special we haven't seen before. The what's the return type of this function? So again, ignore the static. The return type, the name of the function is print me. How many arguments does it take? Zero. What does it return? We've never seen this type before. It's called void. So void is not one of the eight Java primitive types. Void is a special type that is used to denote that a function does not return anything. So if I declare a function to be void, it's special in a couple of ways. First of all, it doesn't have to return anything. It doesn't have to include a return statement. This is a perfectly valid function. When a void function finishes executing, it just returns nothing. So there's no need to put a return statement in there. You can put a return statement in there if you want. So I can stick a return statement right here. In this case, my return statement is not taking any parameters because there's nothing to return. If I try to return something out of this uh, void function, then I'm gonna get an error. This method must not return a value. Why not? Because I declared it to be void. All right, so what, what would I do with a void function? It seems like this is a little bit silly. Right? But the idea is that sometimes void functions have what's called a side effect. 
So here's an example of a function having a side effect. The function doesn't return anything, but I can still tell it ran because it printed something. So there's other examples of this. A void function might modify some state that the program is storing somewhere else or whatever. Um, so just because a function doesn't return anything doesn't mean it doesn't do anything. All right. So let's, let's write a function, shall we? All right, so let's, uh, and this sort of goes along with some of the material that we covered on Friday in the video lecture. So here, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna do this again. I'm gonna change this to doubles just because they're less annoying to work with. Okay, there we go. So I have an array of doubles, and I wanna compute the average. So frequently, particularly in this class, we're gonna use a function to implement an algorithm to perform some sort of computation or solve some type of problem. So here's an example. I want you to write a general purpose function that can compute the average of an array of doubles. All right? So let's give this a try. So what should I call this function? Anyone have a good name, suggestion? Yeah, how about average? That seems reasonable. What is it gonna return? Yeah, so the, if I've got an array of doubles, the return type is a double, I'm gonna call my function average. What, what do I need to provide average in order to, for it to work? Yeah. Yeah, I need to provide it an array of doubles. And what should I call that? I'll call it array. Why not? Okay. All right, so now I've declared my function. And let's try calling it. I'm gonna put a println in here, just so I can see that it ran. Oh, I need, to, I need to preface it with static, sorry. I apologize for this, this is a weakness of the little tool that we use in lecture to do these types of examples. Okay, so let's try calling it. Uh-oh, okay. Um, there's a problem here. So what am I doing wrong? Doing several things wrong here. Okay, so there's two problems. The first thing is I'm not returning something of the pr appropriate type, but I've got another problem. Right, when I call average, I need to provide it with the array. Remember, when I call a function, I've gotta provide it with the array of arguments that it, uh, the arguments that it needs in order to, to work. So I've, I've created my little test array up there and I've statically initialized it. So now let's try this. Okay, so now the next error I'm gonna get is it says it must return a value. So I've declared that it returns double, but there's no return statement anywhere. So I've gotta add that. So let's just get this to the point where it compiles. Okay. All right, great. So now I've called average, I'm not doing anything with the result, but I can tell it ran, and I've passed arguments to it appropriately, and it's returning the right type. Okay. This isn't a bad starting point when you're getting started. Just get to the point where you have the function declaration working, you understand what arguments it needs, and you've got the return you know, a return tape statement in place. Okay, but we actually wanna compute an average here. How do I compute the average of a set of values? What's an algorithm for doing that? Well, don't tell me how to do it. Just tell me what to do. I wanna compute an average. I am 100% positive that everybody in this room knows how to do this. But how, yeah. Okay, there's two steps here. So the first thing I'm gonna do is add all the values in the array, and the second is divide by the length of the array, which is the number of values. So putting together some skeleton comments like this is something that we're gonna encourage you to do and maybe even start requiring you to do so that we can help you in office hours. Describe your algorithm first then we can more easily help you if you're having problems. If we don't know how you're trying to solve the problem, um, we can't help. And if you're trying, if your algorithm isn't correct, it doesn't matter if your implementation works. There will still be wrong. All right, so how do I add all the values in this array? So these are, we did some of these examples on Friday, so I'm just gonna move through this quickly. I'm gonna initialize a variable called sum, and then I'm gonna use my enhanced for loop, 
And again, if this stuff looks unfamiliar to you, please watch the video from Friday. I didn't record it just for my health. So I'm gonna go through all the values in the array, and I'm gonna add them up one by one. Now here, before I move on, I'm gonna put in a print line here just to make sure that I've computed the sum correctly. All right, so again, check each part of your code as you go. This is, this is not something that just beginning programmers do. This is something that I do, okay, every day when I'm working on, on things. Oh, okay, this is mad at me about something. Oh, here we go, yeah, sorry. Okay. So, so, okay, so, and, and if I was, you know, doing this, I would double check. I would say, okay, does that look right? So there's something weird about this, right? Can anyone see what it is? Why, why, it, it looks like it should be 38.2, but it's actually 38.1999996. Why? Anybody know? Yeah, so there's, this is another issue with precision when we use Java. So there's a limit to the precision that a particular double value can hold, and what's happened is I almost have the result that I want, pretty close, but there's this, there's essentially these kind of small little bits of imprecision that have crept into the calculation because of how I represent floating point numbers in Java. But we're gonna be okay with that for now. So I've, I think I have a sum that looks correct. Now I need to divide by the length of the array. So now I'm gonna say, I'm gonna initialize a new val value for this, and I'm gonna do sum divided by array.length. And you remember that in Java, again, if you watched the screencast from Friday, one of the beautiful things about Java arrays is that they know how long they are. I wish that arrays in other languages, particularly languages like C and C++, would do this, but in Java they do. So every, every Java array has a length property that I can use to, con to determine how many elements it has. And I'm gonna take my sum and divide by the array. Length of the array, okay. So now, what I need to do is I actually wanna make sure that this is correct, so I'm gonna print out the result. And to do that, I can call my other function, println, which is extremely helpful, and I'm gonna pass it the result of this computation. Okay. Questions about this? Mm-hmm. Because the array that, yeah, it's a great question, right? So inside the function, the array that's passed is called array. Does that make sense? So the name of the argument that contains an array of doubles inside my function is called array. Outside the function is called to average. And I could create, I could change this, I could say, still works. So the function gets to choose the names for its own variables inside, right? If it didn't, it would be very confusing, because every time I changed the name of the variable outside, I would have to change the function, right? So when a function declares a parameter, when I pass it that parameter, to me, this array is called blah. Once the function starts running, the array is called array. Yeah, it's a great question. You guys will get more comfortable with this as we go on. Other questions? All right, um, oh, wait, hold on. There's a problem with this piece of code. Who can get it to break? What's that? Variable in the function, oh, that's okay, actually. That's not ideal, though, I agree, yeah. Yeah, what happens if uh, I do this? Uh-oh. What is that? <laughs> what happened? Divide by zero, okay. So, let me show you an example of using a, another return statement. So I'm, up here, I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say if array length is equal to zero, I'll return zero. I don't know if that's the right number. There's really undefined. So now my function has two return statements. 